L. Ron Howard wanted to start a cult. L. Ron Hubbard. That's 100% L. Ron Howard. It's 100% L. Ron Hubbard. It's 100% L. Ron Howard. 100%. Nick. What you gotta do is break him down. You gotta L. Ron Howard him. That's not a thing. So much about Scientology except the guy's name. That's the easiest part of it. What was it? Did he invent Scientology like after he directed that draft in Apollo 13? No, that was Ron Howard. I'm talking about L. Ron Howard. Oh my God. Guys, stop. can we please stop? Hey, hey, everyone. How you doing? Hey, um, happy Wednesday night. I'm actually, uh, this is my second talk with Mitch Brisker, who is a person I have known for a long, long time and also respected for a long, long time. And uh, I want to bring him on here. We're going to have a discussion about all things C organization. He, in my mind, has one of the most unique points of view into the cult that is Scientology because he was a working professional for almost 25 years working hand in hand with CERG members and also has a very long uh, track with David Miscavige himself. So uh, without further ado, here is Mitch. Hey, thanks for that, Sterling. Yeah, it, was <laughs> no almost, it was almost 30 years, but I want to thank you for, for keeping me off for the first five seconds because I was doubled over on the floor laughing from your intro. So. <laughs> it's not fair. Is proper. You know, I, I saw that intro like I think seven years ago, and I've just always loved it. And I've told the story to several people about how funny it was, but I could never find the clip. And now that I found it, uh, I, I'm glad it can be used for other yeah, things. Yeah, it's it's not fair. It's like it puts you at a really unfair advantage. <laughs> you uh, know, I, I was listening to Mark. Uh, Mark did a um, a live, I think, with Andrew Gold, Mark and Claire. Uh -huh. and, and he said something that, that kind of resonated with me, which I did appreciate. It's, you know, when you're in a cult for so long, in s ridiculous scenarios, Sometimes you, you have your stories, that your horrific stories, your, your beatings, the stuff that's just, you know, brings you down a little bit. But you just also have to laugh at some things right. because they were so ridiculous, especially when you are now far removed from them. Right. You look back at them and you go, that was just insane. Like, oh, why did I do that? Or why did I listen? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important on our channels to, to have part of that in there. Um, yeah, no, and, absolutely. Yeah. Right? So that, right. That, that's why the, the opening clip, because some of it you just got to laugh about. Some of it's very hard. Everyone has their different emotions. You get me talking about my dad, I'm going to cry a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but everyone has fascinating stories. And I've always, always been super fascinated by yours. And in case people have forgotten already, you and I have this interesting sort of uh, besides working together for a long time, right? I was the one that that saw you on the beach that day in Malibu. Yeah, that's uh, right. I, I had, I had. Uh, it's, yeah, I've been reluctant to tell that story, but you're the person that I really need to tell it with. Yeah, yeah. towards the end of my career at Gold, I became very distraught to the point where I would do anything to get out of there. And what I ended up doing was hurting myself pretty severely, and. Uh, so then what happened as a result of that is that um, they had to get me out of there because you're not allowed to be on that base. You're considered a security risk if you've right. done anything to hurt yourself. And so essentially I was whisked away by a an auditor and a security guard and, um, an auditor and somebody from the medical office. And, uh, you know, they, they took me to a doctor. I got all patched up and then... What started then was a couple of month long, uh, sort of a, I hate to call it a vacation, but it was, a. I'll, I'll think of an appropriate word, but I was literally, uh, they, they needed to get me away from the base. They didn't want Miscavige to find out about this. They didn't want anybody to find out about it. So they started renting very expensive homes on the beach. So I was in one place for a few weeks on the beach in Zuma near where Sterling works. I have, you know, you would it would have taken five minutes of you saying Sterling, remember Sterling, remember Sterling, for me to actually remember. Of course, once I became fully acquainted, I can never forget. So I was walking on Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu one day, and my I was bandaged from this wound that I had inflicted on myself. And um, because it, I'm just telling you, it's happened to so many people. You end up being that distraught and that wanting to not necessarily not be alive but not have that life anymore because that life right. they make that life so intolerable and the next thing i know this is the crazy part is i'm up at gold 
and uh, I'm back there, whatever, it's a good while later, and uh, I get a text from Mark Headley, right? And the text says, hey, Mitch, how are you doing? Are you okay? Yeah. And he obviously saw me because he, somebody, he knew something, so I'm freaking out. And I happened to mention to somebody who was in the room, who was the commanding officer of gold at the time, I said, hey, I just got a text from Mark Headley. Well, they just went crazy, like, and and they wanted to launch this whole investigation into who could have possibly leaked this information and blah blah blah. And so they they want they demanded my phone. They said you have to give us your phone because we're going to do a deep dive and use our best forensic tools. We're going to find out how Mark got your number. And I said, whoa, put the brakes on here, folks. Mark used to be my shoot crew chief. You gave him my number. We <laughs> <laughs> worked together. Okay, so that was kind of the end of the investigation. They were like. Oh, right. Yeah. Mar Marcus had my number. I've had the same number since whatever, since yeah. you know, Hitler was a corporal or something like that. I don't even remember. It was a long time ago. Uh, so, and it, so Sterling had literally driven by, saw me, you know, saw that I had a bandage and, and called, texted Mark and called Mark and said, Whoa. And uh, yeah, I wish I would have reached out to Mark that day. It was a while before I did it. But yeah, so. Sterling and I kind of have a connection because of that, uh, because of, you know, that, that day. So, yeah. That's, that's and the story. And I actually wish I had stopped. I actually really yeah. do wish I had stopped to say hi. I probably would have jumped in your car. <laughs> right. you, you knew the people I was with, at least one of them. You knew the security guy. You knew oh, Matt. I absolutely did. Yeah, I absolutely you, did. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure you knew all of the people I was with. It would have been an interesting scenario. And even then, like even with Mark, I hadn't spoken to Mark in almost four years because I'd been over in Saudi. Really? Uh, oh, right, right. And, but but I had his number. And so I was trying to think, I mean, in, in that moment, I was like just going, I got to tell someone. I got to tell someone. Now, look, if I didn't like you, I probably wouldn't have said anything. But again, <laughs> I'll go back to I always respected you. And a lot of, of the moments that I enjoyed, which were, we're rare and, and far in between at Golden Air Productions in the Sea Org. We're spent on the set. It was mm -hmm. a, right. a release from the normal day. It was, it was a kind of like time off, essentially, because you got to, well, one, contribute to the films, which was kind of fun. But two, you, were, you, didn't, you didn't have pressure. You were out there. You, you could be creative. And you were untouchable when you were on the set. You could not be hassled. That's right. You could That's not. Right. And you know, Sterling, I'll tell you something. It kind of had the most religious atmosphere of any place on the base because people treat each other well. They were respectful. They, it was almost like, you know, the ritual of filmmaking where you have, you know, you're framing a camera and you have actors on their places and, and, and on their marks. And then you have a guy with a clapper and it's all this kind of very structured ritual. It's a little, it's like, <laughs> it was like the best thing going out there. That was for sure. No one could yell at you once the clapper clapped, right? That was nope. awesome. No, was, you're done. You blew a take. You blew a take. You're paying for it up there. Yeah, yeah. right. Exactly. Uh, yeah. That we're exactly. It's like a buck a second when you're shooting 35 millimeter film. Yeah, right. Well, you know, and the other, the, the it's because I called you the other day to talk uh, tonight. Uh, right. I've been, I've been, you know, off the tube for a little bit, mostly because right. I've been busy. And what the, one of the things that got me going, you know, mm -hmm. I need to talk to Mitch was, Something my brother, my twin brother, Justin, uh, Justin the Yeti called me and he was like, Justin is Dave Miscavige's nephew. I mean, right. he knows the entire family. He, he grew up essentially as a Miscavige. Uh, Dave was his uncle. And he's like, right. well, he, he still he's is, listening. by the way. What? He still is his uncle, right? Uh, well, not officially. Oh, no, because he was an uncle-in-law, right, exactly. That's right, right. not officially. Right. And right. Um, and he goes by, you know, he uses the Tompkins last name again. But he said to me, he goes, you know, I've been watching, you know, he watches all the all the channels, and he watched your interview with Aaron, he watches your interview, and he's like, Mitch knows Dave way better than I ever knew Dave. Um, And, you know, and there's levels of knowing Dave, right? So right. Right. I, Justin wasn't there. Uh, when the beatings started, at least he was not there when the beatings became much more public. Right, right. Uh, it was still kind of a a, a well known secret at at the time when Justin left because I believe right. he left around 2000. So he didn't get to see that side of Dave really. He knew he knew there was a a vicious angle to David Miscavige, right. but he never got to see that. As far as he was concerned, as a nephew, I mean, Dave was Dave was very polite and kind. In most right. cases, right as, to, as all sociopath psychopaths can be, 
Right, right. And even Jenna, who has a long experiential track with Dave, and, and obviously when uh, Biddy and Ronnie had left, Jenna felt the full brunt uh, right. of pressure and, and antagonism from Dave. But I don't think she also got to see that side of Dave as much because uh, right. she never worked with him. Now, I right. worked with Dave. And to be clear, right. did not work directly underneath him. I was just in a position enough to be in his vicinity and see how he treated right. other people right. and also did get to see him right. hit uh, several different individuals. But you have such a fascinating take on this. Uh, and I've loved watching your interviews because, and I'm going to ask a few questions that, that I've always wondered about your relationship with him and, right. and your relationship to the Sea Org. Because think about this young kid uh, on your set and he's looking at you and he knows you're a professional. He, he knows that, you know, you're paid more money than us, which I don't hold against you, obviously. I mean, it is what it is. But I'm, I was always fascinated. What was your take on that? Did you ever go, did you ever go, okay, I know Mark Kelly's getting paid $46 a week, or maybe it was 32 at the time when we first started in the, in the early 90s. What was your whole view on that sort of thing? Like, did that occur to you? Did it cross your mind? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Did no, I understand your question perfectly. Uh, if that's a, not a bad place to start, I, yeah. I've been thinking since I spoke with you how to even get into this conversation. But sure, why not start there? <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely, because that thing's really obvious. I mean, the first film I ever worked with them on, the first time we were on location, and we were next to some park, and there was an, an ice cream parlor, like a thirty-one flavors or something, and it was like a hundred de degrees out, and I went over and. I said, I'm going to go get an ice cream. And I noticed that the entire crew's hanging outside because none of them could afford to get an ice cream. And in a situation like that, when you're like, you know, you got to hold a dripping ice cream cone in your hand and you're working, the guys you're working with, like they can't even, they're just waiting for you. You got 25 people waiting for you to have an ice cream. It's, it's pretty obvious. It's pretty hard to miss that conversation. Right. So, right. you know, basically I did a quick head count, gave her my credit card. And, and said, well, give me 23 ice creams. And I walked out and I said, go and get your ice cream. So, <laughs> so little so did you I were know. Aware. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I was totally aware. I mean, I used to joke with them. Like sometimes people would say, God, you're paid so much more than us. And, and, and I would say, yeah, but, and then I'd rattle off all of the things like, you know, a family of four, healthcare, 35% tax bracket, living in Los Angeles, very expensive, no fringes, no, no pension, no welfare no retirement, no nothing like I, because they would never go for anything like that. Plus I'm working at a huge discount uh, on what I would be making for equivalent work. And I said, you know, guys, you don't understand. You make 50, I've literally said this a hundred times. You make 50 bucks a week. I make X a week at the yeah. end of the week. You get paid on Thursday. Okay. By Friday, I'll bet you still got 20 bucks in your pocket. I'm broke. I got yeah. nothing. Right. right. <laughs> okay. So don't, don't talk, <laughs> but I'm serious, but nobody ever, nobody ever held it against me. I, I never, I, I never had a, any kind of like, like a kind of a classist uh, issue about it. Probably because, which I found out much later when I went up there, Jackson, who really just told me this like a year ago, there was a really big concern because, you know, there's this kind of caste system in, in Scientology. You, you were born into and grew up, so you weren't subjected to it so much because right. you didn't, you know, grow up, make a decision, become a Scientologist, experience life as a as a raw, you know, as a humanoid, then a, a raw, then a Scientologist, then a staff member, then a Sea Org member. But there's this concern that you're not going to have enough legitimacy to actually lead a team, right? Right. I mean, not that they were ever to do this on their own because they were not able to do it on their own to produce a film. So Jackson was tasked with making sure that nobody on the crew was like, well, I'm not going to listen to this guy. He's not in the Sea Org. Really? Like he, oh, yeah. Everybody had to like call me sir and call me Mr. Brisker. It was a very awkward to me because I'm like, you know, I thought right. they were talking to my father. Um, <laughs> right, right. So, but it, it was really like, like somebody reached out to me recently, one of the first crew members I worked with. And she said, do you know, we were told by Jackson that not to fraternize, nothing personal, don't get into anything personal, follow his instructions, blah, blah, blah. And if they even looked cross-eyed, they would just be ripped off the set. Now, wow. that changed after the first film was done because everybody sort of started chilling out. And they were like, 
things have been so rough for them in the face of not being able to produce films that when I was able to get some stuff done, they were like, dude, we don't care what you're paid. This right. is life is so much better now than when we were being locked up literally in the, in the dining room, in the galley and being made to like scrub grease out of the fryer. Right. So that, that was kind of the scenario. And, you know, I, I, there were people that I became friends with, I, you know, now looking back, I'm, uh, I'm reluctant to call them friends, even though, the, uh, because you can't, you can't, a friend is somebody that you can really rely, like you can, you can tell them your deepest, darkest secrets, right? And trust them. Right. You can confide in them. You can't confide on Scientologists, especially serial members. You don't confide in one another. Right. It's, it's no, just, you do not. You, you do, do not, not at all. You, you do not. Now people leave. And like, I would confide in, I would confide in Sterling. I would tell him something like Sterling, I need to tell you something. And I could 100% trust his confidence, hundred percent. So like, we're like friends and I haven't physically seen him in like 20 years or something. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it's like, so you, you find out from these people that you went through this with and that you now know you connected yeah. with, that you have more relevant friendships with them in this and moment of time than you ever did. That's uh but yeah, so I think I answered your question about you did. And you know what? It made me think about that because at least in my case, if you had told me you had rent and that rent was high in LA or uh, car insurance or any of these things, it would have gone right over my yeah, head. You, yeah. It's like, what's I that? had zero reality with that whatsoever. So I, I, I'm wondering if the people you, you had mentioned that to, or you spoke to about it just kind of went, okay, because they didn't know, or maybe, maybe they did know a little bit. Maybe some of them had a little life experience. I think yeah. I've mentioned, I learned no joke, how I learned about the, I hate to use the word wog world or the real world. Right. As I was leaving was my twin brother lending me copies of the friends DVDs from season one to I think eight. <laughs> and that was how I, that was that was my set when I went out in the real world. That was, your, that was what I knew was that was happen. your indoctrination. No joke, uh, yeah. and you know it was good. It kind of kept me upbeat because it's obviously a very <laughs> well. Sterling, I could think of many worse ways to be indoctrinated than friends. <laughs> like right? many, yeah. yeah, it could have been. I'm trying to think of a show that would have been horrible, like a terrible, tasteless show. But thank God you didn't watch. Um, no, no. I mean, at least it was a really good, funny show. Right. Yeah. I gave, yeah. gave a little bit of a, it gave a little bit, you know, I was naive, still very, very naive, yeah. but it did give me, it did give me a little bit of taste at least uh, of, you know, what it could be. Um, and of course the first time I made, I, I think a, a scent, I, I flew out to New York right away to see, to see my aunt Barbara's, um, Barbara's sister. Oh. She was a lovely, lovely lady. Right. Right. And of course I walked all around New York everywhere where I tried oh, to yeah. find the friends building and all that kind of stuff. Oh, that must've <laughs> been an absolute glorious moment. Oh, I, I can only imagine growing up in the sewer, knowing you, who you are, getting out of there, and then you just walk. I mean, that must have been the most wide-eyed, wonderful experience. I can't. Uh, yeah, I mean, I honestly, uh, I got lucky, and the person that I was staying with when I first left lived in Orange County, next to four softball fields. <laughs> so I think I played so, for the first like four months after I left. I think I played softball five nights a week. Uh, I would just do wow. go to work and then just head home, eat a snack, and then just go play in whatever league I could. You could like uh, just pick up. You could, they're they're like there's like pickup games at the park. At first it was pickup wow, games, that's and really then I got signed on to several teams. You know, and signed on right. means that you know you made friends with right, the group, right, and then right. they're like come play with us in whatever leagues they were. Yeah, you know, certainly it's funny you said I, that you were lucky because you lived with a person in 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 Orange County that lived right to next to, and I was sure you were going to say Disneyland. <laughs> but no <laughs> yeah priorities i didn't have my sterling priorities no, out. my happiest yeah. place on earth is 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 a diamond a baseball yeah, diamond baseball for diamond. yeah yeah for sure except, not disneyland except, not at all <laughs> yeah except for the baseball diamond of gold it's not the happiest place on earth no right not at all not at all um so, so you okay. did answer the question very well and i okay. i appreciate that yeah, no um problem the so i wanted to get into too so i mean that that's that's pretty cut and clear about, about the pain. I'm actually glad you didn't get a hard time about that. I, whenever I looked at you, I knew you had a nice car. I think you had a BMW when I was there. Pretty much. Yeah. And it never even crossed my mind now. And here's why 
I knew that you were a paid professional. I knew that you were contributing to the group and you were making a difference there. But I was so yeah, and they made I just have to stop you. Yeah. And they made a boatload of money off the work that I did. Yes. I yeah. mean, they made like no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. But then I go, and here just brings us right back to David Miscavige. I saw him having all these things, uh, not a BMW, of course. And I think I've told that story because he's such a hypocrite. He he actually would give people shit for having BMWs in the early, in the nineties, late nineties, early two thousands, because he hated Germany. Yeah. Except, except, well, now he drives a BMW, but remember yeah. the first one, he decided to buy a camera because uh, I was rents, you know, they had to rent cameras so much because I was constantly getting stuff done. He was like, Whoa, Nelly, we better buy a camera. He bought an Aeroflex, like he, he $350,000. I saw the check. So, and that was in 1990, oh, maybe 93, 94. I mean, you can check the date. The first film, yeah. the, the, the first camera, the first major film that camera was used on was Bram Stoker's Dracula, the Francis Ford Coppola film. That would be the circa of the camera, still a, one of the best 35 millimeter cameras ever made. But he sent, remember Kim Freeze? Remember Kim? Yes, I do. Yeah, okay, yeah, she yeah. was an assistant camera person. She was like a, clapper girl right yep and he sent her to burbank to aeroflex with a check for three hundred fifty thousand dollars because you know they don't do leases or anything like that you yeah. know they're, they're the universal had had put down a, a a down pay a lease like they had claimed 20 of those cameras kim showed up with a check and said i'll buy one cash we got one of the first ones that anybody got oh wow. the studios got them because miscavige he, he wanted to make sure to always buy the best shit but he also wanted to be able to brag. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, we got this one before Paramount or whatever. He just like, like he said, you know, if, if you could put in the, in the, in the uh, submission for a, approval to spend $350,000, if you could add it in there and sir, you'll be able to brag about it. That's a yeah. done deal. <laughs> yeah. Right. You, know, you could stroke his ego a little bit. Yeah. With it. No, he was, yeah. yeah, he was like yeah. that about everything. If I remember, yeah. I mean, even his own photography, even his, his own cameras, uh, that was that was a nonstop. Uh, yeah, he had an insane collection of cameras. Yeah, he. I, I well, I remember yeah. I, I chipped in five dollars to them every year I was there. So. Well, I was just going to mention the gift culture at Gold, <laughs> which was Karen De La Carrier asked me if I would do a, a show with her on the gift culture because the gift culture is insane. You know, every year the on birth, on, you know, uh, Miss Gavish's birthday and Christmas, the whole the entire crew, all the crew would get. Uh, uh, like a wish list, and then people would be regged, meaning worked over to to chip in a little bit of their pay. Absolutely. You know, so by the time you're done with six, seven, eight, however many hundred people there, and they're all chipping in five bucks, it's a lot of money. I would get a separate one, a different one. So you know, I got off lucky. I, I'd get to buy them like a seven hundred dollars shirt or something stupid right. like that. So yeah, the, I'm, did you buy him that sweater for We Stand Tall? Because I want to know. Who no, and, yes, I did. But I did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> you did a great job. I wish Have that, you seen the SNL skit for yeah, We Stand <laughs> Yeah, I called that the 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 uh, the bad sweater video. I mean, I've always called it because I can never remember it was We Stand Tall. So yeah. to me, it was, yeah, the bad sweater. No, that was done by the former director, Joe Kinnean. That was oh, the wow. that, that was the last thing they did before I came up. That was the the height of their career. And then yeah. after that, they were all locked in the galley in in the dining room. They were oh, all wow. they were all locked in there, uh, yeah. not allowed to go near their equipment. And there was a film. There was the first version of a film called Start, Change, Stop, one of the technical training films. The first one that I did. The sets for that film had been in the little studio for nine months, just like, you know, City somebody. Man. Yeah, somebody went in there and dusted once a week, and that was like it. You know, it's unheard of that the sets for any film would sit there for nine months. You're supposed to shoot and yeah, and get yeah, it the yeah. hell out of there. So, but it's just, that's the name of the game. It's yeah. why we have the word "hot set" at Gold in Hollywood or wherever else, because it's like don't touch this set because we filmed on it, but we're not done with it yet. So you know, or else if you didn't put that sign on it, people'd come in and destroy it. You know, yeah, you got to right. make room, but that thing had been sitting there for nine months was crazy. I should have figured that something was wrong when I found out that thing had been in there for nine months. <laughs> well, let me ask you know, because everyone's got everyone's got their thing, so yeah. uh, about what what you know, what the thing that pushed him away or the that started the 
them on the road to understanding that there's something wrong here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad Do you, you remember that. yours. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. About when it was. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, I remember yeah. all like 478, 900. <laughs> Let's start with the first one. <laughs> well, the first one was, yeah. you know, I don't think people understand that to the degree to which we compartmentalize. I, I'm sure, I know this is true for you, and I'm sure it's true for me, probably more so true for me because I had a better comparison to the way things should be, right? right. Like, um, although I, I was not unlike you, if, if I had gone to the ranch when I was, how old were you when you went to the ranch? I think I was 12 or 13. I would have been full-time exploring the trails and, yeah. and doing all that kind of stuff. It's like, it's, it's, you know, I grew up in Laurel Canyon and it's like, I was just always up in the hills and there were rattlesnakes and tarantulas and, and all kinds of nasty stuff. But like, you know, there was cliffs to climb on. You're lucky you didn't die. You know, that's right. just like boyhood, right? So it wasn't that wasn't the worst thing in the world. But um, you, we compartmentalize, you know, so you see something and you're not okay with it. It doesn't agree with another thing that you are okay with. And the two things are, are there. You have to experience them at once. Like this is happening and this is happening. I love this person, but they're beating me up. So you tend to put these things in boxes and then you tend to put a lot of pressure on one of them to make sure everything stays in the box. I believe that's the definition of cognitive dissonance. So I started to see things very early on, uh, but because of the importance of the mission and the fact that once I completed a film, David Miscavige took my name, a little piece of tape with my name on it, and he put it up on their org board, their organizing board, right? which is a, a thing which defines the structure of every Scientology organization. Everybody in Scientology lives by this. Where you are in the org board, that defines your job in the, on staff, especially in the CERC, defines your identity. Because your identity was, you were a tree guy. What was your post when you I were doing cheese? Because I know you were in CMO in. You had yeah, a lot yeah. of different actually, Joe Kinnean, by the way, Joe Kinnean was the first trees I see on that property. Right. Which when he got busted from director, then he, he, he was actually a pretty talented guy yeah. and he wanted to be successful. So he became successful at trees. Yeah. But yep. he was trees like that becomes your identity. Like yes. when you were in CMO in, or CMO Gold, which one were you in? I forget. I was I was in CMO Gold, but I was actually briefly in CMO in for about three weeks as, as right. the WDC Gold MAA. Believe it or right. not. So you were the uh, w you were the gold MAA WDC. That was your identity. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. But like big time. Like so. But my point was, he stuck my name on this org board himself personally, and somebody came and got me and said, "Oh, you got to see this. You got to see this." Miscavige. He personally put you on the org board. Like that's a big deal, right? And I looked oh, at yeah. it, and, I, and I'm like, I am screwed. I am not getting out of here, because th what that meant was the only way I could get off that org board and continue on with my career was because uh, I only had a one film commitment was to take my name off the dark board. That's a crime in Scientology. I would have had to have left Scientology yep. to, to not. So I was always having to figure out how am I going to navigate these waters? And then I, I had to literally take the red pill and kind of start to pop out of the matrix before I could realize that the whole thing uh, was crazy. So that was kind of the first thing. Yeah. My name being put on the org board was like. And that's, never... that's funny because that's that's an unsigned contract there. But you subliminally, you would have known at that particular point in time what that meant if your name was to be removed from that org. Absolutely. Board. That like... meant that didn't just mean that you weren't going to be a director. That could mean so many different things oh, yeah. running all the way down to disconnection from your family. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He took himself off the org board. Yeah, excommunicated. I mean, there's so many. Because uh, again, it's it's almost like it's almost like the equivalent of moving up the bridge to some degree and moving up the the, the organizing board. You are still, as you move up, you're you're kind of locking yourself in more and more. You're making that escape door smaller and smaller and smaller right, right. as you progress up. Right. This this in this case, the escape door was made smaller for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, so right up the way that it works is the, the organizing board in Scientology is seven divisions, yeah. right? And if that's consistent across all organizations, it's even applies supposedly to individuals. You could take your life and you could organize it into seven divisions. Um, I don't suggest you do that. But, <laughs> Please, but, no, do not do that. Yeah, that's, you'll, that's a you'll, form of torture. It, yeah, um, it is. But it, it's also that this, I don't know, this is a whole other conversation, but life is, one of the great things about life is that it's a mystery. Yes. And you need to embrace that mystery and somehow within it, find your identity and where you fit in. And 
You're not going to be able to do that in Scientology. But um, yeah, but so then you have the seven division org board and in a regular church, like say Celebrity Center, that division four is the production division. So they produce the product that keeps the org going, right? Right. That they exchange with the outside world. So in the case of a regular church, uh, like an ideal org, that division four would be auditing, training, all those kinds of things. That would be in division four. But now gold is not a, it's a production division. It's not a service division. It's not selling services. So at gold, division four is the, 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 uh, the different, it's broken into cine, we film, audio, right? This is division four, right? Yeah. You were an HCO guy. You know this better than me. Yeah. <laughs> this is, yeah. But this is, this is almost ancient uh, um, scripture to me. Like, like I yeah. do know it, but <laughs> right. I, I wouldn't even try. Like, that's all I find amazing about Aaron is, is, and Mark Headley is their memories of the specific types of organizing yeah. boards for well, You know were. why? Well, I, I say they're why, but it's actually, you, you fit in that category too. There's certain people that they didn't actually do a lot of Scientology and they're so lucky. Yeah. Like you, you, the three guys you just mentioned, yourself and Aaron and Mike, uh, and I'm sorry, yeah, and Mark. Yeah. The fact that they were workers and, and worked really hard and did really good work um, and, and kind of thought Scientology was bullshit. When yeah, they, yeah. When they were doing it and, and they they were less, I, I mean, I, I, I don't want to speak for you, but they, in my observation, they're less traumatized. Yeah, you know, I agree I, with you. I think that makes the 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 releasing, the letting go of that particular part of it much easier. It did not yeah. take me long. Like when I left, I'm never doing Scientology again, right. and I'm just not interested. Right. And it, it, there's a very clean break when it comes to that particular point. And I do agree with you. I think I there. I think there's several different types of Sea Org members, and mm -hmm. one. A particular group would be the people that just wanted to do a good job right. at whatever they were doing. Right. They did not right. really care about how that went all the way down and how that affected everyone. It was this minutia right. in front of them. I, I need to do this particular thing well and right. just do it. That's it. Right. I just want to have my statistics right. up and I want to be competent in what I'm doing. Right. And some yeah. of those things were pretty spectacular uh, in a real world level. Like Joe, we were talking about Joe Kinnead, who yeah. was bust, busted out of Cine. He ended up as the dumpster I see. Uh, Miscavige created a job, you know, a post for him. Dumpster yeah. I see made him a little name tag. And then he, he was able to, he worked his way into doing trees. Nobody was taking care of the trees at Gold. And they had, apparently they had some, somebody come in and do uh, uh, what do you call it? Like an appraisal on the property. Yeah. And they said, whoever is taking care of the trees has added, like, do you know what the number was? Something it was like 12, 20 no, it was, no, this was this million was Reynolds told me that when yeah. he was, when he was the estate set gold. And ironically, it was after Dave Miscavige had gone down to LA on one of his uh, little fun trips with Tom Cruise, I'm guessing, right. and uh, had seen some Magnolia trees somewhere in Beverly Hills. Now Magnolia trees, I'm going to bore the hell out of everyone. So this is going to be fun. <laughs> Magnolia trees are structurally are gorgeous trees. Right. They got really thick leaves. When you right. prune them, they look very structured and formatted. Now at Golden Air Productions, we had a, a vast array of native Californian trees, willows, uh, oaks, mesquite, uh, mesquite. Uh, we, had, we had eucalyptus, which is an invasive one. Now you right. can prune eucalyptus to look okay, but it's never going to look like a magnolia. No. Never, not in a million years. Anyways, Dave, at one point, just decided to make the comment and say that, oh, you know, the trees here looks like Edward Scissorhands uh, went out of control on, on the trees at the Golden Air Productions base. Now, I had never seen Edward Scissorhands, so I, I didn't know what he was talking about necessarily. I'd actually go ask someone what that meant. But he was basically <laughs> shitting on, on the trees department at that point. And Wendell being the, I think, Wendell, Wendell did not like Dave. I, I, he never said anything to me directly, but I, I'm going to, he just had that tone, that tone about him that was like, Dave's a little bit of an asshole. He's an idiot. Uh, anyway, so Wendell then told me the story about the $12 million appraisal after that, which made me feel right. a whole lot better, right. which is so one thing you, I love about Wendell. Yeah, but that's an example of the Sea Org members wanting to do a good job yeah. and doing such a good job that they increased the value of the property by $12 million. So, and what would be the purpose of saying like, so there's back to Dave Miscavige yeah. again. Why would you say that? What what purpose did, did was that was that to make things better? Was that to 
uh, lift someone up? Was that to maybe say, hey, can we look at the way we're pruning our trees? Maybe we could do different. Or how about, hey, why don't next time we landscape something, why don't we use some magnolias? No. Yeah, absolutely. His sole purpose is to belittle individuals yeah. and make them feel bad. That's right. what he did as a yeah. regular norm to good people, to people you've known, to Jeff Hawkins. Um Mark Headley's and we could go, we could go on forever, but. Oh yeah. I mean, all the people, most of the people, the whole first generation of people that I was friendly with and that I really admired and that made it feel like, yeah, okay. If I'm having a bad day, maybe it's just me, you know, like Mike's mom, she was like, you look at Rosemary and you think, well, she's okay with this. What is my problem? Right. These were like really good people. So, and they're, they're gone. They're all gone. So. Yeah. Yeah, they're all gone. And you know what? I, again, I've I've listened to a lot of your conversations. I'm mean, no, sorry, I've listened. I think every one of your conversations. I've not I've not well, caught up on, on the films yet. Yeah. Okay. And and what I appreciate about a lot of the things you talk about is well, one, it's clear to me, and this is my opinion, that you're still working through this stuff. I think a little bit. You're still, you are. You, you're still coming to grips and even the way you talk about it. And I'm not saying that I'm not either. Like I still deal with a lot of stuff. It's just not, it's not as, as a parent as people may, may think just because I'm a little more closed off and I, people never believe me when I say I'm closed off, but sometimes I actually am closed off. I'm very picky, very picky about who I let into my life and who I speak to. I, I have a very select group of people I talk to and that is partly because of my experience there. And as things you've mentioned where you didn't really have friends there, you couldn't confide in people because you were worried that, that, that something would be said or it would get out or you would get in trouble. Now I see, or they'd get in trouble because they yeah. didn't do enough about what I said. Yeah. Or they didn't stop you or you said right. something. And I look at, I got, I got removed from Simo gold for apparently black PRing Dave Miscavige. And by black PRing, I just asked openly, uh, the question, why couldn't I be at the 1993 World Series if he was? Right, <laughs> because right. That's what I was actually, I was a right. little annoyed about that, that, you know, why couldn't I be there? I love baseball arguably more than that guy. I didn't understand. <laughs> I didn't do my job. Why I couldn't be there. Um, and there's a whole story to that. But what I want to say to you, though, what, what I just want to make clear to you is I, I, I do see that you're, you're working those things out. I also, I also know you, you as a person in your character. And that's why when I saw you interview with Aaron and I asked Aaron for your number, I chose to reach out to you because I've never doubted your character and who you are. Well, I so appreciate that. All of us get on here. We all say things. Some things may not sound right. Some things may be a mistake to say them. Some people, some things may offend other people. But I, I know Mitch Brisker. I know you. And I also think that besides you being a good person and that that's a for sure fact to me. And I appreciate you as a friend. I think you lend such a valuable thing to, to, to this whole network. And if you're not already, if anyone that's watching this tonight, and I know we're doing it late at night, and I hope this hits Europe and all of our, all of our, the people that watch SPTV over in Europe, uh, you need to watch stuff because it well, is. We're, we're, we're actually doing it for them. I thought, Sterling, I thought we were doing it for our friends in Europe. I think we are, yeah, but I've got to so. be to be completely upfront and honest. It's also I get off work late. I work really yeah, hard. Yeah. Um, and I just I thought, hey, this would be a good night to do it. Uh, and I and hey, so I, you know, I'm I'm missing a baseball game tonight. We're, we're, the Phillies are playing right now, and, and there's nothing more I enjoy than watching baseball game uh and having a drink. So I'm I'm skipping that because I really want to talk to you. <laughs> so, I really I really appreciate that. So um, Europe, yes, we're doing it for you too. Um, yeah, so if you noticed, I changed the subject because I couldn't take the compliments anymore. Oh. <laughs> I, I totally deflected, but Sterling, thank you so much. It's very sweet for you to say that. I really yeah. appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think this is an incredible community. Um, yeah. It's very cohesive, very inclusive. I mean, you know, uh, a, a, a apostate Alex worked himself half to death and needed a 32 hour break. So he fell asleep and missed a stream. And this community sent the cops to his house to do a welfare check. <laughs> Halfway across really? the world, yeah. <laughs> so this is like, and he's like, <laughs> I talked to him, and he said, I, yeah. I should let him tell his own story. But he said, Yeah, I woke up. The cops were there. I thought Osa was fair gaming me. So, <laughs> oh my god, can you imagine that feeling? Yeah. Wow. And he was just like, No, I was just asleep. He had his phone off. 
So, oh, but that's... I think that we have to, when I heard that happen, I had to acknowledge that this is an amazing community that cares about the members of it so much that they would even, somebody probably in the US called London and said, hey, wow. can you go to this guy's house because he's MIA? So yeah, it's right. pretty cool. And I think we're doing a good thing, but you were talking about, for me, is it helping me? Absolutely. It's, okay. it's, it's been huge. I mean, there's a couple of things that sort of got me through this. I really collapsed. I thought, I wrote this, and I have a book coming out soon, and I wrote at the, uh, I shouldn't say it at the end of the book. I can't say it now because it's just a spoiler. But I discuss the illusion of thinking once you make the decision to leave Scientology, for me, uh, as deep as I was in it and the, with the, and the time and the experiences, you're, you 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 take on this kind of very magical thinking. You have to, to yeah. buy that con for so long. Yeah. And that magical thinking leads you into believing all you have to do is make the decision and you can leave. It's not true. Right. That That's where it starts. That's not the end of it. That's the beginning of it. And it's not easy. I had a, I went through a complete physical and mental collapse that I am only just barely recovering from. And if it wasn't for video games, writing a book, and and the friends I made on, on on YouTube, I wouldn't have made it. Like I'm telling you, I wouldn't even be here talking to you. Wow, 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 wow. No, really. And you know, sorry, I do go long in my compliments. By the way, that, that is my character. I, like I said, I try to yeah, look at, I try to look at everything, but I'm also terrible at taking compliments. So I yeah, understand. no, like <laughs> yeah, I try to be more like you know Mark Twain to quote Mark Twain. Yeah. Uh, he said he had a, a really hard time with, I hope it was Mark Twain. Somebody yeah. will correct me. Uh, he had a really hard time with compliments because they were never enough. So but, <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> well, um, so uh, just, you know, if it's okay with you, I wanted to go for about uh, 50 more minutes. We'll talk about a few things. We we're going to do this again for sure. Oh yeah. Uh, because uh, I want to get in some other deep stuff, but until my um, dog goes out of control and starts barking. <laughs> cool. Well, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you. So, so you have you, you you talk about the video games. You talk about your book, which uh, I cannot wait to read. And and you know, I wish I was a writer. I'm not. Uh, my little sister Jenna is. She wrote a fantastic book, uh, which describes. Uh, I, I, being I would, a child. I would, I'm going to just stop you right there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> being being a writer is not a make break of telling your story. It, right. I, I'll tell you something that I learned, which is a very valuable lesson. Being a storyteller is more important than being a writer. And if you can tell a story, and if you have a story to tell, you'll figure out how to write it. It's, Interesting. You, you, a writer doesn't qualify you to tell your story. You okay. qualify yourself to tell your story. And I'm telling you, if you if you can if you can see that story, you can write it. And if you can't, there'll be people that'll come out and help you. And it's not hard to do. It, I mean, it takes a lot of work. I mean, I wrote. I started in February. I wrote 96,000 words and since then. And that's like, people were telling me, wow, that's like blazingly fast. But I wanted to do it while I was like hemorrhaging. Everybody right. else, and this is not a criticism. I read, I've read, i read every book by every ex former Scientologist. And some of them are really good. Some of them are just great books. None of them are bad. And right. uh, they're all worth reading. And they're all incredibly unique because they're reflections of the unique character of the individual. So yeah. you can't, you, you could never say, oh, yeah, I read a, a book from a former Scientologist. It just, no. it, 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 you, but, but the thing is, they all wrote them 10 years later, which was fine because that filter of time, the being able to reflect, the being able to look back, ha having processed it is incredibly important. But I want to do that too in 10 years from now. But I also wanted to do it while I wasn't, while I was not even sure where the ground was. I right. wanted to try to like put something down into uh, an authentic, what I hope people would embrace as an authentic human experience. So, and and I, you're, you're selling yourself short if you're saying I'm not gonna write a book because I'm not a writer. You know how many people that aren't writers write books, Sterling? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Like, yeah, I, oh, I'm yeah. sure. You know that, that, but honestly, that's the one reason why I, I'll, I'll always appreciate Aaron for for luring me into this because um, I find this format um, talking, catching up, uh, telling stories uh, live. I find it um, so much more. It, well, it's enjoyable. Let's put it that way. And I, and I still have anxiety every time when I get on there. Of course, am I going to have enough to say? 
Am I going to have something to talk about? But what I found is that this community has got such a great cast of people with different angles and, and views on stuff that it's almost endless. And you can, and people keep telling me, you can talk about the same story over and over again. And I'm talking to you about something today and you're talking to me about something and there may be new people watching it from a different angle or a yeah. different location. And that is what is kind of amazing about this format because it just continues to grow. YouTube will throw it out whatever way they want to. And again, uh, two new people see it and then you go on another interview. Right. It, it's almost like it's so fun to see what the results going to be just from just from the like the interview tonight. Who's going right, to see it? Right, Who's going to make right. a comment? Well, yeah, I have to say that I was I was actually talking with somebody earlier. Maybe I was talking to Mark uh, about the uh, the number of websites. Yeah, I was talking to Mark Headley. If you counted the number of actually individual websites that the Church of Scientology has planted on the internet, uh, without and I'm not even counting the hate sites, the Stanley sites all the stuff they've done against all the quote unquote SPs. Yeah. I'm talking about just that this is who we are with the church of Scientology, all of its affiliated churches and groups and missions and, and groups, you know, Narconon and social betterment programs. If they all have, if you count them all up, the church of Scientology has more of a, more occupies more real estate on the World Wide web than any other entity in the entire world. I have, and I know this and I feel this because I was there in 2008 when anonymous happened and we were building this and they were paying hundreds of thousands of dollars a month to hire the best architects of reputation management and the best architects of, of, of search engine optimization and people that had worked for Google and went to college with Sergey Brin and his partner who founded Google. I mean, there was no end to the, to the level of contractors they were hiring. Right. Well, at the same time, they were spending millions and millions of dollars developing these websites and having some very highly trained and skilled slave labor in the Sea Org do a lot of the work, and yet you have all of us doing this. Um, I know what uh, 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 Sterling told me what equipment he has. I don't know what he pays for internet. I know what he spent. It wasn't much. Okay, yeah. so yeah. he didn't notice it. Like it just went on a credit card. And same for me. I have a working <laughs> tears, but you know I pulled it off. And um, and this whole community has spent like nothing, and yet there are more eyeballs on us. And more people want to hear from us than have ever wanted to hear from the Church of Scientology in their <laughs> entire existence. So it's a pretty amazing phenomenon. And most of these people are not, you know, they're mostly what they even have identified themselves as the never ends, people that were yeah. never in Scientology. There, there are people that love true crime. There are people yeah. that have had trauma uh, from relationships or other cultic relationships or high demand groups. And Scientology is by far not the biggest. I mean, there's bigger cults, you know, no offense to Mormons, but they do have some issues and they have $300 billion. Yeah. You know, Scientology's only got $3 billion uh, and, and on and on and on. Yeah. But there's so many people who are interested in Scientology today because yeah. Scientology today, in addition to being a bottomless pit of hypocrisy, it's a worldwide crime scene that's yeah. unfolding in real time. And all of so many of the victims and witnesses, because everybody in this quote unquote SPD TV community, we're all victims and or witnesses to an international crime that's happening in real time. And that's fascinating to people. Yes. The Church of Scientology, they cannot compete with that. They cannot say, no, 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 but we're good enough and make it interesting. Yeah. Or they, believe me, they would. I, I used to get paid to try to help them do that. And I just got frustrated and left. So, but, yeah. Well, it is. It is It is like it's actually a live action documentary yeah. of yeah. the fall of Scientology. Yeah. It, weekly like there, there's yeah. there's stories about old stuff there's history yeah i mean it's there's so much, again there's so much good stuff right now and so much yeah. good reporting and fascinating stories i agree it's 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 like a really good crime drama unfolding live yeah. Before yeah. real time in real time real it's time crime yeah. scene. yellow yeah. tape everywhere do not cross yeah yeah okay. <laughs> it's just like it, it that's exactly what it is and yeah. and, and miscavige has just not a clue and everybody who's in, they think we're crazy. Yeah. They think yeah. we're wildly insane. Yeah. And it's, you know, because until you take that red pill, you're. Yeah. yeah. And you see a lot of the comments that were, and I, I've noticed them uh, in 
different interviews where, where there'll be people commenting on, you know, they're interested. They're like, well, some of you guys are kind of well-spoken and, and, you know, you present yourself well. And it's funny because when you get on here and I'm sure Mike Brown will say this too, you, you feel like you're not doing that. You feel like you're sitting, talking to that. You're looking straight into a camera. You feel like you're stuttering or you're repeating words too much. But these people out there that are watching this are, are, are kind of lifting you up and letting you know that, you know, hey, you are, you're doing good. And they even throw in the random, you know, piece of advice and, you know, why don't you try this? Or, I mean, one person wrote a couple of weeks back saying, you know what, you really don't need to be, to have all your ducks in a row perfectly. Just get on there and start talking. Yeah, it's a very inclusive, uh, very supportive yeah. community. I, it's one thing I wanted to bring up. And I, if I don't, I'm going to regret it because, and then, you know. <laughs> I'll, I'll be texting you about it all night and saying, hey, What's that? no, it was just, uh, I, I don't know when it was sometime within the last year, maybe like a year ago. I, I, um, I never worked with Amy Scobie. Uh, I, it's just because our jobs were such that, but I knew her pretty well. Uh, and I had a lot of conversations with her. We interfaced in a couple of things, but not very much because, you know, she was WDCCC and she had these kind of jobs that didn't interface with my jobs at all, but I really knew her and I always liked her and thought she was really a, a really just a nice fun person, which yeah. means I wasn't behind the curtain on her stuff because it got pretty bad. But I, I wrote her just to say hi. Like I sent her a message. I sent her a text just to say hi and, you know, chat. And she, she asked me a question, blew my mind because nobody ever asked me. She said, Hey, I just have to ask you, Mitch, what did you think of us? Oh, okay. Like, what did you think of us? And I never had that viewpoint that I was such an outside person that I would have the view that I would be able to answer that question. I never thought about it because we were all Scientologists. You know what I'm saying? So, and we were kind mm -hmm. of all on the same team, but I really had to think about it because, uh, I did think a lot of different things. I, 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 one of the things I thought was for the longest time, I really respected Sea Org members. I, and I think you, you kind of expect it to as a public Scientologist because that's the cast, right? right. You have public Scientologists, you have Sea Org members, you have top executives, you have celebrities, super celebrities, donors, high donors, super donors, uh, super, super donors, Tom Cruise, and then Dave. And, and yeah. that's like the cast system, right? And but I always had this reverence for the Seer because for me to sign a billion year contract to live that austere lifestyle, I mean, what do they refer to it as like a monastic gold? They, they get this this language from the lawyers, I'm sure, and they yeah. refer to it as a monastic retreat, right? Which is just like <laughs> okay. insane. And a yeah, yeah. monastic retreat where you're banned from having sex or drinking or having fun, but you can swear and smoke cigarettes as <laughs> much as you want. It's just not very, I, I never got the monastic or the retreat, but there was this kind of reverence for me because I was like, fuck, I could never do that. Right. right. I could never make that kind of sacrifice. I need to get in my expensive German car on Friday night. I need to, to drive. There he goes. And I need to hug my kids and, yeah. stay up all night and watch a movie and whatever, do all the things you guys couldn't do. And there were times when I got stuck up there. I think the longest was about six weeks. And I, I was just going out of my freaking mind. Like I couldn't take it, that kind of schedule. You know, I mean, I, I, I was, I had a unique uh, perspective in terms of my position of observation. Right. But I never thought for a minute, that I was in that lifestyle. And it really, Amy really reminded me that how much respect I had for the people like her and Mike Rinder and you, and even you who wasn't, you weren't like trying to take the world over as a Zurich member, but no. just this kind of level of esprit de corps, this level of wanting to do a really good job. Right. So I, I never actually really gave Amy an answer. Maybe she'll invite me on and I'll do that. But I answered here, Amy, if you saw it, I had a tremendous respect for you guys. I really did. And that's uh, perfect. That's such a perfect answer because that's kind of what we were talking about tonight. And I think I think in the future, I would love to have a conversation with you about this because you had mentioned about the positions on the org board and stuff like that. And, right. and how that's how you looked at other people. You looked at right. senior members with the right. reverie, the respect. And it's interesting because like from my point of view, uh, gold in base was my group. Right. Pack right. would be the other people. I, oh yeah. I, we, I would, we, we kind of look down on. Yeah. Them. I would naturally, and I hate to say that and I'll be completely yeah. honest. I would look down on, on, on pack and I would look down oh, yeah. on anywhere else. It, it was yeah. our group, 
but I wouldn't look down on you, which is an interesting scenario. And I, but I'm I'm betting that some people maybe did there. But they kept it quiet. They had to. They kept they, it quiet because yeah, there was also there was Peter, who was a, a music professional that was there as well. He was Peter a mixer. Schles? Um, not Schles. He was a. Oh, Peter. Yeah, Peter. Um, he tragically died of cancer. Yeah, yeah. nice guy though, because I got to because I worked with Steve Marlowe for a while. I got yeah. to meet him. I didn't look down on him. I thought, hey, this is cool. No, because we really also really wanted to be there. Yeah. Like we wanted to be there working at Gold with the Sea Org. Right. We wanted to do that. I didn't want to be with the Sea Org, but I considered it a privilege right. to be working with the Sea Org. As a Scientologist, that was a big deal. And then as years went on, I mean, I never intended to do it for as long as I did, but as the years went on, and people would say, uh, people at Gold, uh, people I knew, friends of mine, would say, wow, you're not public and you're not Sea Org. You're like living some weird kind of twilight zone. And that was very true. And that ended up becoming a very difficult, very complicated uh, uh, kind of life situation to navigate because it's it's not a good mix. And I knew it from the day that I set foot, that I, when I started working there, I knew this has got to be a temporary thing because it's not good for me and it's not good for the crew. They need somebody to help them get films going. They don't need a, a well-paid somebody who makes many times more than they do to do a job that that Hubbard expected them to do. Right. It's, there's always an underlying kind of attention, even if nobody notices it. It's like, it's like you know, a bridge which which gets so much traffic, and yeah. all the vibrations from the from the trucks slowly eroded away, and then one day it collapses. That it's the same kind of phenomenon that there's always that sort of unspoken thing that it, it, that it's like uh, sand in the gears and so but yeah you know it it never finally i was able to train somebody to do what i did and and then i because i always thought if i trained enough people if i got them up to a certain level i could sneak out the back door because i right. was a loyal scientologist i'd be able to sneak out the back door and the gold can carry on in perpetuity making high quality films which they can now and they do they no longer have the importance in the world of scientology that they once right did. Right. Miscavige took that away. Gold is now, and I've said this recently, it's a backwater production facility that still performs an important task. You know, they do the ads for the Super Bowl and stuff for the TV station. But they're well, sorry. Well, I think Scientology and the Seerg would be unrecognizable to someone like me who left in 2004. Oh, yeah, you probably. Yeah, you, when would, you were you, explaining SMP yeah. and and who yeah. he's taught who who Dave has as his henchman and who they like. Yeah. Besides Molly, I don't even know any of those people. I, I knew yeah. Henning Bendorf. I knew Lisa Schroer. Yeah. I knew a lot of people way back when. I mean, right. unrecognizable. Yeah, me. Lisa was my, yeah, Lisa, who'd been busted out of uh, CMO. She was a CMO, HCO, HCO chief CMO, I think. Yeah, something like which that. Which was yeah. Mike Winder's old job. <laughs> um, she'd been busted out of there, and then she they made her my assistant, and then she used that as a platform to to launch yourself into being the commanding officer of gold. Boy, that was fun. I mean, yeah. lucky for me, I had her on my side, but she was just like a pit viper in, yeah. in terms yeah. of being not a good person. No. Uh, and and then who's the other person you mentioned was, oh, uh, you mentioned Lisa Schroer and there Henning Bendorf. Henning, who, at, okay, at 22 years old, he was the assistant art director. And when his boss, who was my art director, hopped the fence is the way I always put it when somebody left. I'd say, oh yeah, they hopped the fence. Uh, she was, I didn't get along with her at all. She was, I didn't like her art, her way she designed. We fought like, like cats, you know, <laughs> we fought tooth and nail over every, every single thing. So then she left, I was so happy. I grabbed her 22 year old assistant and I said, dude, you and me have got to finish these films because I was so dead set on completing my mission to get these tech films done. And so, you know, I took this guy and I got him all kinds of apprenticing. I hooked him up with a guy named Alan, Alan Roger Jones. You can look him up. He was one of the major uh, art directors on Star Wars. And he did like the Death Star interiors and the, and the space bar interiors. And I'd worked with him on commercials, he really noted art director. And he, he lived in Malibu and, and I had brought him up to design TR5. YTR is the film with Isaac Hayes. And uh, I introduced him to Henning and I said, listen, I want you to teach this kid how to design films. They set up fax machines, one in, in the art department and one in his house in, on the beach in Malibu, and they faxed designs back and forth, and he taught that kid how to design. Really? And then, yeah, and then eventually he was elevated from being my art director to uh, Miscavige made him like the lead art director of the whole world of Scientology, right? Yeah. So, so for a while it was like me and him doing all the art stuff, and then 
Danny Sherman writing those ridiculous speeches. And that was kind of like, it, yeah, it, that that's it, Eddie Bendor's story. It's you know, I tell you, that I gotta no tell one's you, spoken about him. Like he doesn't get mentioned that much and I don't understand why. I think, yeah, he's yeah. an important guy. He's a very yeah. important guy. He, I mean, he, turned into, yeah. he turned into a total asshole. Yeah, he yeah used that to I be, know. He really yeah. used to be a nice guy. Yeah. When he, yeah. he and I did Div 6 together, we right, designed... Right. We designed, he was my designer on the industry of Death Museum, on uh, Div 6, uh, and all the tech films. We designed those. And it was the tech films that we designed that then Miscavige hired Gensler Architects, one of the biggest architecture firms in the world. And he says, look at our tech films. These guys have figured out what a church of Scientology is supposed to look like. And that's what visually is what got that whole thing going. That's not why he did the ideal org thing, but that's one of the things that spurred it on because we'd figured out what a Scientology space was supposed to look like. Cause we had to shoot one and there was no model for a Scientology space. They look like shit. Right. They were, they were like, you know, walk-ups over a vacuum cleaner supply store or some stupid right. shit like that. So he and I, you know, we poured through architecture books. I taught him everything I knew. This is way deep. And we designed these films that then became the prototypes for all of these beautiful churches. Well, have you have you spoken? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll end right after this one. Okay, we'll do a no couple problem. of questions and comments. Have you spoken to Mark about Henning in your, in your film series yet? Or uh, no? Not really. We probably, I don't know why we haven't, um, but but we will get to that. I think one of the reasons is the there was a couple of very key films that some of the films were very fantastical. So right. they took place in very fantastical uh, locations or sets and so forth. Uh, some of them were like space opera and happened in the future. Some of them had sequences from the past. Some of them were very straight up modern day, took place in a church of Scientology. And we haven't gotten to those films yet. Right. But and, you know, we had to scratch our heads and go, so what does a church of Scientology look like? And we figured it out, you know, it, it, you know, and, and it's like, I can comment on it now that, you know, every religious place in the world has very distinct, um, recognizable imagery. Like, you know, there's a Torah or there's a wailing wall. There's a there's a, a, a place that tells you where Mecca is so you can pray. They're very recognizable things, right? Every right. You can go in any synagogue, any Christian, Catholic church, any Muslim church in the world, and it will be different, but it will have these very specific things. You can go in any church ontology in the world and it will have a bust of L. Ron Hubbard and a reception desk and a cashier. Okay. <laughs> these are the kinds of things that you will find that are these equivalent religious artifacts because it's not a religion. It's a business. It's a con. It's there to separate people from money. And, I, and, and having spent so much time working out what the interior of church ontology looked like, I, I think I can speak with some uh, weight on that subject. But <laughs> no anyway, kidding. Sorry no for kidding. getting going, but no, that's all right. That's all right. Um, I'm going to throw up real quickly my my little uh, my wait screen. So if you guys want to wait here for one second, I'll pull up some questions and some comments, yeah, and then please. we'll finish, wrap this up. Here we go. Hey, we're back. All right, I got some good ones here. I got some good ones. How do you pull that off? I can't do that. Do I what? Don't get away with that shit. Oh, <laughs> Maybe. look it. I wasn't gonna fight the dead the dead air thing. I was like, no, I'm sorry, uh, not gonna do that. So I, I 
I was like, hey, you no, know, it's what? really I'm gonna... smart. If I didn't know better, I'd think you used to work for a, a media powerhouse. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to put some of these skills to use somewhere. Yeah, right, no, that, with... <laughs> that's a great idea. Who doesn't love Jeopardy music? Yeah, right. I had a bunch uh, of people say that they might take it down because of Jeopardy music, but you know, <laughs> they might. I mean, I uh, or they might actually just do a revenue sharing thing where they, okay. yeah, because that's happened to me. I put a couple of things up and I got an alert. You know, this is not a hit against your channel, but we're letting yeah. you know someone's made a, a copyright claim and you're sharing revenue with them. I'm like, that's okay. Okay. Oh, hey. Yeah, I'll do Sharon, that. Sharon's caring. All right, here we go. Uh, Joni Cummings. Mitch, you're a you're you're a wordsmith. Oh, Joni, you are she, you know, <laughs> thank you, Joni. She loves to just embarrass me and flatter me. It's good um, because <laughs> I've only picked compliments to make you uncomfortable for the last half of this. Yeah, I think wordsmith is one word, isn't it? <laughs> um, it might be, but uh, you know, Sorry. yeah, don't yeah. point that out. <laughs> there we well, go. it's too late. I've already done that. But thank you, Joni. Um, I really worked hard at it. Um, I even in my final two years at Gold, I I told I made them. I said we have to start writing all of our our scripts, new stuff, uh, in genderless pronouns using genderless pronouns. Uh, and that was a tough battle, and I won the battle. I'm sure they've reverted. Uh, you know what I mean? Like if 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 the like new stuff. I say like if Hubbard said humankind, I mean mankind, whatever. We're not going to change it because Hubbard said it. But if I'm going to write humankind, I'm mankind. I'm going to write humankind. Okay, we're going to get rid of all these genders because we really want to speak to everybody. Yeah. And I was really just doing it to push their buttons. <laughs> but I I did get them to agree, and the people that were writing with me and under me, all they, had they did it. They all had to do genderless pronouns, which I don't think they understood the concept, really. <laughs> no, I don't think so either. Well, no, I, I explained it to them. Uh, you know, you know, Jane Austen is one of my favorite writers. And in, in Pride and Prejudice, uh, um, whenever, like, there's a character reading a letter and the letter is from a person of an unknown gender, so she would refer to them as them because she didn't know what they were. And I'm like, guys, this is good enough for Jane Austen. Like, it's the <laughs> it's least good enough for you. Do, so... <laughs> Yeah, it's good enough for us. So I'm All a right. big proponent of genderless pronouns. Chaz B, why is sci why is Scientology? Well, okay, I, well, I'm going to read it as it as it's written. Why is yeah. Scientology seem? Why does Scientology seem to be a very cuss word oriented? Oh, why do they um, swear so much? Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if you uh, have an opinion on that. I have. I really opinion. don't. The funny thing is, is that. Well, I think because Hubbard did. Okay, I've heard that he just swore like nobody's business. But then he was also quoted as saying that that swearing is an indicator of a of, of a small right. vocabulary, if I remember. Right, right. As a matter of fact, I once read something he wrote about a script. Somebody had written a script, not a, a staff member, a senior member. And because I was reading everything he'd written about script writing, I'm going to stuff, and he's writing about this person's work. And right. he he describes his reaction as a wall of profanity. And I thought, wow, that's really good. I actually use that. Uh, rather than swearing, he said it was a wall of profanity. So he used to say this kind of anti-profanity type stuff. But it, you, from everybody I know that works with him, they're like, nah. You know, then they're having to cut things out of lectures of him saying racist things and blah, blah, blah. I don't really know what it is, why they swear. You know, they don't do that. But here's the thing. I... Think about this, Sterling. If you go into a service org, you're not going to hear that. Maybe behind the lines, right? At, at you know, but not because they're so public facing. But at Gold, we were like, you know, no one was getting through the gate. No I one think was watching was, us. Yeah, I think it was part of the whole sailor routine. To be honest with you, I think it was. Really? Uh, my, my, this is my opinion. Like we're the rough and tumble. We're the tough guys. We're well, the, that's true. We're, we're sailing. Yeah. We're basically sailors on a boat, essentially. So we, we, we cuss like sailors. That's what I always. Oh, that could be. Uh, yeah. yeah, except sailors also drink a lot. And <laughs> <laughs> no, look at it. To be clear, uh, um, uh, I think I told this story with Aaron once. I was talking about uh, a friend of mine when I was out here. He was trying to understand Scientology and the Sea Org, and he was like, "So let me get this straight. You were in the Sea Org." Yes, it's an organization that has the word C in it. Yes, you were in there for how long? I said, eh, about 15 years. He goes, how much time did you spend on the C? I said, I visited the free winds once. He goes, you got screwed, dude. <laughs> you didn't get any of the perks of being on the... No, none, none whatsoever. All right, here we go. We got... Um, I think I, you're right, though. It's the tough guy thing. It's yeah. like, we're tough. We swear. 
Yeah. One of DV survivor Johnny Depp's randos. I only put this one up because this person obviously knows me a little bit and knows you because he put a cookie in front of my name. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> he put a camera in front of yours. Right. So, thought that was pretty mm -hmm. nice. Okay. Uh, I think this answers your question. Jacqueline Leach. Leach. Uh, according to Google, Mark Twain said that yeah. he could live a good two months on a compliment. Yeah, listen. Yeah, no, you're right, Jacqueline. And thanks for putting that out. Um, I have to tell you that I'm kind of famous for distorting these things and twisting them into my own words. You know, uh, so yeah, you're right. Because I did re revisit that quote and he said, I could live two months on a good compliment. And I think it was somebody else who said that I hate compliments because they're never enough. I mean, I, I was always butchering Orson Welles has one of my favorite um, quotes is an Orson Welles quote where he says, well, of course, if you want your story to have a happy ending, it just depends on where you end it. And then I would always, I would always turn that into, well, you know, if you want to have a happy ending, you just have to stop the story before things get fucked up again. So I, I have a hard time sticking with the actual quote. I, I think Winston Churchill probably sounded would sound more like the first uh, quote you had. Yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, here we go. This one. Um, uh, Adrian B at Mitch Brisker, I get the feeling that you had to carry so much on your shoulders, including protecting the base members work who worked around you so heavy and heartbreaking. Yeah, a, a little bit. I mean, one of the reasons that I stayed and we didn't really get into this, but when I actually saw the kind of emotional terror that the crew, some people that I really cared about were subjected to, it, it it put a damper on me, like, I'm just going to leave. I'm going to get the hell out of here. You know, screw it. They can just do this themselves. And then I think about these people, and it would it kind of be like, oh, you know, maybe I can work it out another way. But, yeah, it was a pretty big burden. But it's just like, you know, we pick our burdens. It's yeah. just like I made the choice to do that. So Yeah, and I think, you know, again, after listening and talking with you, I kind of want to try to imagine how bad it would have been if you hadn't been there because oh. even though even though there were still miserable times you put this little kind of a little cover over yeah. over that area yeah. for a time by being yeah. competent in what you're doing and yeah. made that area thrive which it did for a very long time yeah nobody from cine went into the went into the hole or i mean we yeah. did there were some moments where you know i was subjected to horrific security checks and yeah. the entire crew was made to sleep in tents you know, yes. on the on the grass and stuff like that. But for the most part, it was uh, we had some good good. You know, we, under those circumstances, we had a lot of positive stuff going on. I agree. All right, um, Ivor Mechton. Are these Scientology <laughs> films available online? Oh, Ivor Mechton. Uh, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> yeah, Ivor Mechton. Are these Scientology films available online? Uh, no, as far as I know. Unfortunately, Mark and I have talked about that. That, you know, we would, I mean, you know, if I had Elon Musk's money, I would like offer a billion dollars to the first <laughs> person to walk out with all of the technical training films. I would but, love to see him just to see, just to, oh, just to, for the memories of it alone. Yeah. Um, and some of them we shot two, three times. So it would yeah. be really, I'd like to intercut them all. Yeah. You know, right. Like, yeah. You could do a show. Okay. Um, Mr. Crow, has Mitch mentioned anything recently on when his book is coming out? Oh, oh, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, I'm, I've been a little remiss in not keeping everybody updated. Okay, so I have a release date. It's in November. I'm going to be announcing that soon. Within the next couple of days, um, the manuscript is completed. It's about to be turned over to the designer. I have an unbelievable designer who uh, um, I'm not even going to get into anything about who that person is or who did it. I'm just going to say I'm incredibly lucky uh, to have it be working with somebody. So it's being turned over to a designer. The cover is complete. I'm going to do a cover reveal. Within a couple of days, I'm going to announce the, uh, the actual release date. And I'm trying to do something special with it, partially because of the title, you know, Scientology, The Big Lie. Um, I'm trying to, you know, if you publish your book on Amazon, it's not going to get into bookstores or libraries because Amazon bookstores and libraries don't buy from Amazon. So the book will be available shortly for pre-order on Amazon, but I'm also going to launch a marketing campaign with the hope of getting it into bookstores sometime before Christmas. Cause there's a, it's not even that I want it sold to people to buy it as much as I want them to walk into a bookstore. Cause there's a lot of Scientologists that will be ship Christmas shopping and they'll go into bookstores because people love to go into bookstores to buy like, you know, you when you're going to buy a book as a gift, you you want to kind of see it and hold it. And there's a lot of Sea Org members that aren't going to be 
looking around. You know, they're going to stay away from the section that says that says Scientology. You know, Scientology books, but it's a little different if you can get in a bookstore. So especially if you can promote it into a bookstore. And you know, I worked on a campaign that sold 10 million uh, Dianetics books. So I'm going to be extending my Indiegogo campaign to raise money for the camp for the the marketing campaign, so that I can get the message Scientology, the big lie, into bookstores. So all of those uh, Scientology Sierra members will have to walk by it because you know wow. you you're not going to run into it accident. You know, you know you can wow. avoid it on you on yeah. Amazon. So anyway, that's what's happening with it. it's really exciting. In the next few days, I'll be launching the web page for the book. The release date it'll be available for pre order, and there'll be merch totally just related to the book and that'll be that and that's that so I'm, amazing yeah so go to my indiegogo campaign i don't know i can't put it up but no I no no but um i i can probably add it in, in the in the either the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you can put it in the links um if you can find it just indiegogo you can just if you type in indiegogo scientology the big lie it'll probably okay. come up on google and or you can go and buy me a coffee or we'll be launching the merch store shortly well, all the funds that i can raise for this will be going to an a marketing campaign and i've and got good people helping yeah. with the market campaign the goal is we want to get an end cap at Barnes and Noble, so when you walk in the store, you just get thrown. Well, oh, <laughs> but I'm going to do what I do for all my favorite books when I go into Barnes and Noble, and hopefully the, I don't get thrown out for this. I will go find my favorite book at the time, and I will take them and put them yeah. on the tables as you walk right in. Yeah. So that so that people see them. So I, I will absolutely go down and do that. Yeah, and book. and it's a whole level of messaging yeah. that's not available on YouTube yeah. on, on Amazon. So I'm really hopeful to get that going to, uh, you know, because right. you have to very carefully design ads. Yeah. You have to, you know, try to connect with me. <laughs> I'm going to go to the next question. Okay, sorry Here. about that. No, don't worry about it. Uh, Tiny Turtles. Um, I'm still not convinced that Justin is a real person. <laughs> Mitch, it took, you, it you took me Justin? a while. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I don't, you know, I, here's the thing. I, yeah. I, I'm sure I did years ago. He was at the base. You probably did, but you're you're gonna have to join the Aaron Club of of I don't really know who he is. I've never seen him. I've yeah, never I met think, him. I mean, it's, listen, yeah. if he's not real, you really pulled off a great. Scam. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, you really have. You know, like. <laughs> okay, you're gonna you're gonna appreciate this next one. By the way, you really okay, are, because uh, I think you saw this movie. Uh, Neen Polite Sterling, look for the fight flight or fight clip from the movie Airplane where Robert Stack is looking to avoid the religious people. One of the guys is like Scientology as he falls off the screen. Do you remember that? No. Is that a real thing? Did that really happen? Yes. I was watching the movie as a kid with my dad and I heard that and I was like, oh, so excited that that that, that was in that movie. It's like, dad, right. you're Scientology in Airplane? Not knowing that it was a joke. Right, but it was a Scientology. it was a religious slur. <laughs> That's really funny. Because I I, th I think uh, I think in the scene he's walking to the airport and there's several different religious groups uh, approaching him and he's basically throwing them all to the side and one of them happens to be Scientology. Well, it is a great clip. Um, that was that back. was that was was that like the eighties seventies one wasn't that? Yeah, it was. I think it was the either late seventies or early eighties that movie. Yeah, that was came a out. long time ago. I know, right? Just dated myself. Did you okay. ever? Did you ever read uh, William Gibson's Neuromancer? No. It's considered by many to be the greatest science fiction book ever written. No, uh, no. Yeah, you That's... should read it. Uh, uh, William Gibson, you know, he was the only sci-fi writer. He was a real sci-fi writer, not like Hubbard. He's the only science fiction writer to ever win the Hugo, the Nebula, and the Philip K. Dick Award. No other writers won these. Those all three. He wrote a book called Neuromancer. You know, he's the one that invented the term cyberpunk. He's the one who oh, wow. he, he wrote about the internet in the eighties before it existed. Like he made it up in his head and then it happened. Like wow. he's a, and the word cyberpunk, cyberspace, those yeah. are all William Gibson terms. Oh uh, wow. It's called that what is it called again? And it's a trilogy. It's called Neuromancer. Neuromancer. Okay. Neuromancer, uh Burning Chrome, and Mona Lisa Overdrive. He he wrote Johnny Mnemonic. Okay. Um, he wrote, but they, they've never made a, one of his books into a good film because they, I guess they don't know how to do it. But in, in Neuromancer, there's a, this crazy kid. It's, a, it's about a bunch of like, uh, like rebels who are trying to free, uh, an AI from cyberspace who's right. under, this AI is under corporate control. And it's actually a, a, like a character, the AI. So he was, this is in the eighties. He was so far ahead of his time. No so kidding. yeah, I wrote about him in my book because because uh, there's a there's a parallel between 
uh, the internet, what happened with Scientology and the internet and what William Gibson wrote about in the eighties. Like, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's fascinating. Stuff. I mean, I'm sure you're well aware too, that in, in the fifties and sixties, forties, fifties and sixties, they used to hire science fiction writers as part of think tanks. Oh yeah. Absolutely. To come up with, yeah, new yeah. ideas and new concepts for the military. Yeah. I actually, Mitch, this is one thing since, since we uh, have never really just sat down and had a conversation. I don't read a lot of fiction. Actually. Yeah, I don't either. I don't, I don't either. I'm a huge nonfiction fan. I, yeah, I, I love I history. Listen, yeah, I, I love. I, I love, love listening to psychological. Um, yeah. uh, Aaron's conversations with Reese, where, where they're talking about their knowledge of stuff from Nicole, are driving me insane. Right. right. I, I wanted to call him on the phone and answer like every question. Right. Uh, that right. he had. Right. And, and that's not saying I'm super smart. I'm just really good at trivia, and I you do read. love history. You read and you pay attention. Yeah, yeah. We um, call that we call that smart. <laughs> but I and I know he's playing it up a little bit. I know he's playing it up a little bit. But I, I want to get on there with one of them and, and do that because it looks like so much fun. Well, yeah, uh, but you're just spoiling their fun because they, you know they have this brand of playing dumb, and it's like everybody <laughs> loves it. So you don't it is spoil entertaining. It. it is entertaining. All right, I think we yeah, got but, one but, last but, one. but hold on. But my point yeah. was you yeah. uh, about it was I was going to say something relevant to the, the Robert Sack film was that in Neuromancer, um, the kid who's the main protagonist. He has this kind of nutty aunt or his aunt is kind of this nut. And he's describing about how she's gone through all the fad religions. And now this book takes place, it's probably supposed to take place in maybe, it was written in the 80s. So he's he's predicting 2040 around there. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. Okay. And and so she's gone through all the, the crackpot religions. He's kind of making a joke about it. And he says, yeah, now she's on Scientology. But... <laughs> I'm like, oh, and I was telling everybody, you should be happy about this. He's saying Scientology is going to be around in 2040. So yeah. <laughs> there's actually quite a few people in the in the chat talking about it. Uh, so you've just yeah. given some people some good new reading material. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sure a lot of the readers yeah. put a one in the chat if you've ever read William Gibson. Yeah, and, there we and, go. And All if right. you've not uh, read William Gibson, don't ever contact me again. Um, I'm going to end off with one last little okay. nice comment. I need a polite no question. Just want to say you're both awesome. Thank you so much. Mean polite. Um, very much appreciated. Yeah. And and thank you, Sterling, for giving me an opportunity to talk about my my glory days working with the Sea Work because it was <laughs> it was Mitch, something thank else. You. No, thank you so much for coming on. we we'll do some more of these because um I always Please. enjoy talking to you. You're like you, you're like very me. well educated, you're fun to talk to. Um, I, I know I can learn stuff from you. And by the way, whatever I spent on my setup here, I want to point out that I got free advice from Mitch on how to light yeah. it. And how to set it up, and I yeah. Look at that. his lighting, people. <laughs> look at this man; he's completely pulled it off. And and I'll just and anybody out there, I don't care who you are, if you have any questions about how to light this kind of thing, you can email me at Scientology the Big Light, and I'll be really happy to to to, to help you solve this problem or or figure it out because it's not hard. I mean. <laughs> But Sterling did it. No, but, <laughs> no. But the thing is, anybody that ever worked around gold, they're they're a bunch of gear Nazis. They have a very high standard of what quality is. So you know, it's like, congratulations, you really pulled it off. Thank you. So you much. You're a credit to your last lifetime. <laughs> Thank you so much, dude. You're welcome. All right, man. I'll catch you later. Good night, okay. everybody. Take care. Thanks, Sterling. See you later.